Anyway, without further ado, Alan, I'm Maria Brown. Thanks for coming. Uh, so I broke out of Stony Brook Hospital just to get here to the evening. So it is my pleasure to uh, welcome my really dear friend, uh, known as Campbell Scott, but we call him Buzz, uh, to SOMAS today as your featured speaker. And I first had the opportunity of meeting Buzz uh, at Brookhaven National Laboratory through their uh, Office of Educational Programs. Scott Bronson had called me up and he's like, you got to get here. There's this really cool dude who does really cool stuff with ROVs and students. And he's seen some amazing stuff. So I went over and met him. And we've been friends ever since. I don't even know how many years ago that was. Quite a long time ago. Uh, and he's going to show you some really great stuff today. But he's been working uh, on the ocean for the last 50 years from hauling lobster traps out of an open rowing boat called the Peapod. Again, I do bat work, so this stuff is, I don't know, uh, this new day, Peapod, to diving a remotely operated vehicle 4,500 meters into the deep sea and working with scientists on the research vessel Nathaniel B. Palmer around Antarctica. So you'll see some of that today. Uh, he was the first person to capture on video deep sea squid carrying their eggs. So I think he's got some cool footage for you on that today as well. Uh, he is the founder of the nonprofit organization called Ocean Wide, Oceans Wide, uh, back in his home state of Maine, where he worked with K through 16 plus uh, level students in uh, robe education, diving, and removal of ghost nets and traps. Uh, he's worked with deep sea researchers and archaeologists with Bob Ballard, uh, David Packard at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, for Eric and Wendy Schmidt aboard their research vessel, Cal 4, and he uh, even has a squat lobster, I think you guys would know that better than me, from Monterey Bay, named after him, so it's Lunadopsis scottii. <laughs> you say it better than I do. Cool. <laughs> I did learn Latin, biologist. Just not marine science, but uh, he learned to fly a deep worker 2000 with his friend Sylvia Earle. I don't know how many people can say that, but friend Sylvia Earle and Mike Collins. Uh, he's the epitome of the modern day explorer and has worked with some amazing people at the Explorers Club in New York City, of which he's a member. Uh, he is also the recipient of the U.S. Service Medal. Uh, of all the amazing things he has done in his career, the work he does back in Maine with kids at risk in marine conservation and policy is remarkable. And I think you'll really be fascinated uh, by what you see, what he does with his students. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Buzz to tell you all the amazing stories, the incredible footage that you'll see. Um, and he is, I think, considered the second, I probably nominate the best deep water arm operator in the world. So you'll get to see some of those deep water arms that he has operated in the footage. So, you Thank you. Well, Maria's pretty much told the whole story, so I'm going to just show you some pictures and uh, let you ask questions. <laughs> um, so I, uh, I started at Oceans Wide in, uh, oh gosh, I think it was 2004, and uh, we've been doing it full time for about 12 years now. Uh, but uh, it all started back uh, in Maine when I was a kid. So I grew up on this little tiny island that's two and a half miles long and a mile and a half wide. It's the furthest inhabited island on the coast of Maine. And uh, uh, I had a really incredible childhood out there. I tell people that I grew up out there, but I can't really say that I grew up out there. You're not allowed to grow up out there. You just grow older. And so I spent my days in boats uh, traveling around uh, the islands, uh, checking out the seashore, and uh, just having a blast. Uh, so this is my house. You can't see it very well, but it's, it's that far from the water. And this is my front yard. That's uh, Old Cove. It looks due south, and the only thing standing in between me and the Caribbean, I guess, is uh, uh, Matinicus Rock, which has a lighthouse on it. And uh, we used to go out there and, and study the puffins. Um, a really amazing way to grow up. I started in a little pea pod, as uh, Maria was saying, and uh, they're, they're 16 foot double ended boats and all the kids had them and we would race each other around the harbor, row around the island, go to the different islands around the island that I grew up on, 
Um, but I quickly move from the Peapod that you see here, uh, obviously that's not me, that's the 1800s, to uh, a boat, uh, this is the, the small open boats that we have, and, uh, and eventually graduated to a 38-foot lobster boat that uh, allowed me to haul 700 lobster traps. Now I fished on Matenicus um, as a lobsterman primarily, but I also fished as a saner. Uh, when I was 17 years old, I learned to fly the Super Cubs, uh, the little uh, single engine planes, and we would spot fish, so we'd go up in the air. This again is my, uh, my front yard, and uh, we would watch the fish come into the cove, we'd shut the coves off, and we'd catch sardines. I don't know, how many of you young people have eaten sardines before? There we go, all right, <laughs> nice, I love them. Um, but we don't catch those anymore because uh, the, the, the uh, fisheries pretty much collapsed, along with the scallop fishery, the cod fishery, and the shrimp fishery, and uh, primarily every fishery up in the, in the Gulf of Maine. It made me very sad to see that happen because I love to fish. I love to get out there. I love to catch fish. I love to fill my own freezer with fish that I have brought in from the sea. And so I eventually decided that I wanted to go back to Maine and, uh, and do my best to see what we could do about restoring these fisheries. But a few things happened between now and then and now. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, 10 years old, I was in my pea pot, I was rowing around, and about from me to Maria, one of these guys blew. I was 10 years old. It rocked my boat, and as it blew, it blew what it blows out of its blowhole all over me, and uh, I kind of went, ah, and watched as it went into the deep sea, and from then on, from 10 years old, I always wanted to know what the heck these animals see when they're swimming around day to day, and uh, that kind of stuck in my imagination and, uh, and put me on the track that I went on. This gentleman who was a, uh, uh, a veteran of World War II, he was a humanitarian, went into uh, uh, Hiroshima after the bomb was dropped. He came back to the island and, and ran the general store out on the island. He saw that spark of imagination in my head and he told me, get off this island, go see the world, and do what you can to make the world a better place. I said, okay. So I fished out there until I was 27, um, decided to take him up on his uh, advice, and I went to the University of Maine. I studied uh, architecture when I first got there, uh, decided that I liked engineering, so I studied a little bit of engineering, and then I decided I liked biology, so I started studying biology, and I, my, my best failure ever was going to college. I learned about all the things that I wanted to absorb and, and learn, and I did my best to, to, to learn all that I could about these three things. And it served me well after I got out of college. I went on to work with the Navy Seabees. I was a, an engineering aide and uh, a heavy machinery operator. So I learned to drive boats. I learned to fly planes. I learned to run just about anything that had a steering wheel or, or uh, a bunch of levers and, and motors and made things go and, and move things around. Uh, this all served me well again. A buddy of mine from Matinicus Island, the island that I grew up on, called me one day and said, would you like to go to the Antarctic and work down there with me? And I said, eh, all right. So I got on a plane and I traveled for 27 hours and uh, landed down here on, uh, on the uh, Palmer Peninsula. I worked there, worked around and worked in McMurdo. Um, basically have circled the entire continent of Antarctica on our little boat, the uh, Nathaniel B. Palmer. She's 103, uh, 308 feet long. 103, um, she's 308 feet long, uh, five or six decks high. From here to here is 70 feet, and I've crossed the Drake Passage and seen waves, green water, lap underneath those, uh, those bridge wings. It's, uh, it's, it's quite an Quite, an ex <laughs> uh, quite exhilarating to, uh, to be up on the bridge and watch that sort of thing happen. Um, one of my favorite stories is I got to 
work on that vessel and we retraced uh, Ernest Shackleton's step, uh, uh, I guess you wouldn't call it a cruise, his drift uh, throughout the, uh, the Scotia Arc down there. And uh, it was pretty neat to see some of the places that he went ashore. I don't know if you know anything about Shackleton, but uh, he went into the ice, wanted to transit across the continent, got stuck in the ice and drifted for 400 miles, got out to Elephant Island, left his men on Elephant Island, then sailed in a 21-foot boat for 800 miles and uh, eventually was rescued, brought uh, the rescue boat back and, and collected his men off Elephant Island months and months later and didn't lose a single soul. So he, uh, he was quite, a, quite an, an adventurer, an explorer, and uh, probably one of my heroes. Um, while I was on the boat in Antarctica, I got my 15 minutes of fame. I was in the National Geographic. That's my backside leaning over to get a piece of ice. And that's about as famous as I ever got. Um, got to meet the, uh, the, the uh, people down, or the uh, animals down in Antarctica. <laughs> Fell in love with them. Uh, stayed there for eight years until I was asked to move on and I got another job in California. But I got to see the good side of Antarctica and the bad side of Antarctica, the rough side of Antarctica. This is uh, crossing the Drake Passage, 50 foot seas, um, 30 to 50 foot seas here. Uh, I love showing this to kids because they stand there and do this. <laughs> but uh, we buried that bow a number of times. Uh, we pushed the bow of that icebreaker into a quarter mile of ice and taken 24 hours to break that ice. And we broke that ice for 24 hours so that we could get in and rescue a Russian science team that, was, that had run out of fuel, they'd run out of food, and more importantly, they'd run out of vodka. <laughs> when they found out we were a dry ship, they turned us around and said, thanks, but go away. <laughs> um, some of the beautiful, most beautiful sights I've ever seen have been down in the Antarctic. Um, this is a, a crazy group of people that sailed a 60-foot vessel across that water that I just showed you to sail around the icebergs down in Antarctica. Some of these pictures are mine. A lot of them aren't. We have uh, a group file that we uh, use to share uh, so that we can do educational outreach with our, our uh, program. So some of these pictures you might have seen before because I understand there's some professors here that go down to the Antarctic and study the whales in these, uh, in these bays. So the krill come into these, into these bays and you'll, you'll find 300 whales in these bays just uh, moving around real slow because they're fat, they've eaten as much krill as they possibly can. Sometimes there's three, three feet of, of dead krill on the bottom that they've, you know, they've spooked and they've, they've uh, suffocated and so they'll fall to the bottom. But the krill, I mean, they just feed so many animals down in the Antarctic and it's, it's really neat to see these whales. Um, and they're not afraid of us at all. They just kind of lay there. And uh, these guys, they're so fat that they're, they're half asleep and they're just laying on the surface. They'll blow and they'll go down. They'll come back up and they'll blow and go down. Um, got to see orca. Um, I've seen uh, probably 500 orca in a, a given day. And uh, we were in a little zodiac for those of you who don't know what a Zodiac is, it's an air-filled chew toy for whales and seals. And we were in the Zodiac. I was teaching a young kid how to, how to operate the Zodiac. And he was driving along, driving along. And the captain, who was about two miles back on the big steel ship, says, Buzz, there's whales in front of you. I said, ah, there's no whales in front of me, Cap. It was a flat, calm day. And I said, I haven't seen a fin one. And I haven't seen a spout. I haven't seen anything. And uh, he said, Buzz, turn around. So I turn around, and I'm looking at this fin that, uh, so here's our chew toy. But I'm looking at this fin that comes up. It's a big male, and his fin's about this high. And he's going across the bow, um, from perpendicular to the bow. And uh, his fin comes up, and his fin goes down. And uh, as soon as he goes down, 
the water starts boiling the whales have come up it's almost like he said it's ok you guys can come up you can check them out there's nothing scary about them and uh, and this is what we were looking at we were surrounded by uh, families of orca pods of orca that all come together they say that there's uh, 70,000 orca down in Antarctica and that day I felt like I'd seen them all so uh, so I was sitting in, in the boat and uh, I heard somebody behind me say, oh, I can touch it. And she turned, I turned around and there was a calf basically swimming around, checking us out. And all I could think of was a mama bear and her cubs. And I said, ooh, pull your hands and feet inside the boat and let's go back to the big orange boat. So I started up the boat and we zipped up and uh, the bow came down and the rooster tail went out the back and at just at that moment the three people that were sitting in the bow of the boat their jaw dropped, their eyes opened up and I thought to myself in a split second this can't be good and I turned around and there were two female full, blood, full sized female orcas in the wake behind us in the rooster trail, tail and they full, full body out of the water hit the water, came out of the water again and I thought this is the end they split off and never bothered us once. And we got back about halfway to the, the boat and there were so many orca and they were making so much noise that uh, they had wound up all the animals around, the seals, the penguins, all, all the things that were around me. Uh, and uh, so we stopped and an Adelie penguin jumped in, hit my buddy in the, in the thigh, dropped in the bottom of the boat, looked around at us and went, eh! and jump back in the water. <laughs> so while I was down in Antarctica, I got to learn, I, I learned to fly this little vehicle called an ROV, a remotely operated vehicle. A guy that, uh, w the scientist that brought it down, he had flown it once or twice, and I had never flown it, and he wanted to do uh, a, a transect of one of the uh, icebergs. So he put it in the water and he said, here Buzz, you fly it. And I flown and driven a lot of things, but I'd never flown one of these. And I have to say, I was hooked the first time I, I got on the stick. Um, we, uh, we flew the iceberg, and he got a lot of great data, and he kept bringing the, uh, video, the ROV back to Antarctica over the eight years that I was there. And so I got pretty good at it, and I thought, this is, this is what I want to do. And uh, we had the storm that the green water came down the back of the boat and it literally destroyed a whole science cruise. But the crew and I were able to pull this, this cruise back together and we made it happen for the scientist, the chief scientist that was on board and he was so happy about what we had done for him, he asked if, I could, if he could do anything for me. And I said, I'm applying for a job at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute and I would love it if you'd like, write a letter for me. Well, he worked in Moss Landing, which is right across the slough, and he uh, went over and actually talked to them and told them to hire me. And uh, so I got a job at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute as a mechanical engineering technician. And I helped them build the, uh, this, this system, which is a, a deep water system that uh, is, is operating 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's uh, uh, the Mars program is what they call it at Ambari. Some of you might know it as the Ocean Observatory Initiative, which is uh, a bunch of instruments cabled into the deep sea, uh, giving you real-time data back ashore. Uh, so I, I did this. Um, not not sure if you're familiar with the Monterey Bay uh, and the canyon outside, but you go from shore to 4,000 meters in a very short time. You can be out there in a couple of hours and diving in 4,000 meters uh, water depth in, in no time. And so David Packard picked this as the place to start the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute uh, because he wanted to be on the front edge of, of technology for the deep sea. Soon after I was uh, honored by the, uh, the team that flies uh, their, their ROVs, they asked me to come on board to fly their main vehicle, uh, which at the time was Tiburon. And then we upgraded to this vehicle, the Doc Ricketts. So Dave, this is uh, one of your buddies. <laughs> so this kind of gives you an idea how big this system is. So uh, I'm I'm uh, all of five foot eight maybe, and uh, I have to stretch to get to the top. Uh, it weighs about ten thousand pounds. 
It's capable of diving to 4,000 meters without a problem at all. It has manipulator arms, one here and one here. Sampling devices down underneath that we can uh, use a suction sampler, basic, basically a, a deep sea vacuum cleaner. And uh, 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 documentary uh, quality video, all kinds of different cameras, lights and systems, CTDs, uh, transponders, responders, and um, equipment that we need to keep, uh, keep ourselves safe down there and do the science that needs to be done. I learned to fly this vehicle uh, because one of our scientists broke the uh, motor mount off and I was in the machine shop building something for the ROV and they came running in a panic, said, you've got to fix this, you've got to fix it. And I said, on one condition, I get to learn how to fly the darn thing. And so I got to learn to fly this with Sylvia Earle and Mike Collins. And everybody knows who's Mike, who Mike Collins is, right? You know Sylvia Earle. Well, you know Buzz Aldrin, yeah. Neil Armstrong, yeah. and that other guy? That's Mike Collins. All right. So Mike, Mike and I hit it off because I had a name that he could remember. And, uh, and so we got to fly this vehicle for about six months, and uh, it was a, an amazing opportunity. You sit in it like a lazy boy chair, and you drive it with your feet. When we get down to depth, uh, we get to see some of the amazing creatures down there. So Maria said that they named a, an animal after me. Uh, that was one of about 450 that the teams that I work with have found. Uh, this is a, a viper fish, viper fish, dragon fish. I always get them confused. Viper fish. We got to see the the sea mounts in the in the uh, Monterey Bay that uh, <clears throat> had these amazing corals. So this is a small coral. You can tell by the size of the squat lobster here. Uh, uh, sponges. Uh, this one is probably somewhere in the range of a thousand years old. We've seen others that are that have trunks on them this big around that are uh, they they say that they're about two thousand years old, and uh, we just get to go down and fly around these things. It's great. Get to fly around the hydrothermal vents at the uh, up in uh, Juan de Fuca, up uh, off Canada. Um, out uh, in Hawaii, we've done some down in the uh, Sea of Cortez. Like I said, we found 450 new species. This is a mystery mollusk. I like to call it Woodstock because I think it reminds me of somebody that I knew as a kid. And uh, this is the squid that Maria was telling you about. So we had a gentleman that uh, was a postdoc at Ambari and he came out on the boat and said, I need you to find me a squid that carries his eggs. I said, fine. And this guy got seasick, so he took a Dramamine, and he sat down behind me, and in the time that it took for his Dramamine to kick in and him to fall asleep and start snoring, I found this gal. So I woke him up, and he, he, he really rebounded quickly. Um, and he said, uh, yep, that's the one. That's the one we want. And I said, so should we catch it? He said, ah, no, let's follow it around. So we followed it around, followed it around for about an hour and a half, and it's in the oxygen minimum layer, so it's not moving all that fast, and we're able to keep up with it. A 10,000 pound vehicle trying to keep up with a squid in the midwater is uh, sometimes a very difficult thing to do. But uh, she let us follow her around. She was about at the end of her life, and uh, in that hour and a half, she started hatching her eggs. So we not only got to see this animal for the very first time, but we also got to see her eggs hatching, and then we caught her in half the egg sac, and he was able to, uh, to make a pretty good career out of just that one catch. And we went back uh, the second year, and we did exactly the same thing. So now they're seeing a few more of them, and they know where to look for them, but uh, it was kind of, kind of a, a, an honor again to uh, be able to say I, I was able to catch the first squid like this. We did also monitor the Humboldt squid that uh, they, uh, they can get up to, uh, well, she's six foot two. And so the squid is laying on the deck. So the squid's at least six feet long. And uh, they hunt in packs. They're, uh, they can be really nasty. They, can, they like to grab divers and pull them down. 
So uh, the scientist that studies these animals uh, was actually grabbed, pulled down, he got away and came back up to the surface and, and survived and, and most everybody does. They, they, don't, uh, they don't do it that often, <laughs> but in Mexico they say that the, the fishermen uh, have been taken down by them. But uh, uh, we watched them go from the uh, Mexican border and migrate all the way up to the Canadian border. So they were, uh, uh, their, their food source or whatever, the conditions were just right. And they kept moving north more and more every year and we watched them do that. And it's, uh, it's amazing to watch them fish because they'll come into the, into the lights of the ROV and they'll grab the little lantern fish that are hatchet fish that are swimming around and are attracted to the lights. So, uh, it's, it's amazing to watch them fish. Here's another one. I'll just let Bruce, Bruce Acropin Robeson is a tell small, you the story dark about this fish guy. with large fins, a tiny mouth, and a remarkable right. pair of eyes. The two green spheres in these video shots are the lenses of its tubular eyes. Behind the eyes is a set of large scales. The eyes are enclosed within a transparent shield, sort of like the canopy of a jet fighter. In front of the eyes are two dark capsules containing the fish's olfactory organs. Typically, Macropina sits quietly in the water, using its big fins for stability, while it scans the water above for food. When it spots food, it can rotate its eyes to look forward, to include its mouth in the field of view. We speculate that Macropina steals food from siphonophores, elongate animals with tentacles that capture prey that swims into them. And we think that Macropinna swims into the tentacles and steals the food from the siphonophores. The shield over its eyes protects those sensitive structures from the stinging cells in the siphonophores' tentacles. It can also rotate its eyes to avoid predators or to avoid being captured by scientists. <laughs> this is Bruce Robeson at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. So Bruce was uh, uh, another mentor of mine, really wonderful guy, and uh, I think that he and his team uh, were responsible for describing about 50% of those 400 species, 400 new new creatures that we saw. But uh, David Packard, like uh, my friend back on the island who ran the general store, was uh, uh, he played a big part in my life. He told me when I started working at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, he said, get out there, learn as much as you can with us, do as much as you can, do the best that you can. And he says, and when you get to the point where you feel like you've learned everything, he said, don't get bored with this job. Go out and make the world a better place. And so he, uh, he uh, had a big impact on my life, and he did some wonderful things in his life. So I was... Uh, I was inclined to listen to him, and, uh, and when I was done with the Monterey Bay Aquarium, I, I realized that it was time for me to come back home and start my project in Maine, and that's working with the kids like myself who grew up in a fishing village, not knowing what they wanted to do really, but uh, needed some help, needed a mentor to kind of show them which, which direction to pick. and. Uh, and, and, and just help them choose that direction. So, uh, so I, got, I went back to Maine and started the, monitor, uh, started the Oceans Wide program <coughs> and quickly ran out of money. <laughs> so I started working with this guy, uh, David Packard. And I hope all of you know who David Packard is, right? I, I mean, Bob Ballard. I don't even know who he is. <laughs> Bob Ballard. Everybody knows who Bob Ballard is. Uh, Bob Ballard. Um, found and, and studied the hydrothermal vents back in the 1980s. And uh, he's most well known for his uh, discovering the Titanic, the wreck of the Titanic. And I got to work with him. Find, uh, we dove on uh, hydrothermal vents. We dove on methane seeps. We dove on uh, the U-166, which was a, a German U-boat that went up into the uh, Gulf of Mexico and was uh, sinking ships. They were coming out and going into the, the uh, Mississippi River. And so we found the U-boat. We found a couple of boats that, she, that had been sunk by her. And uh, I've studied some amazing things with him as well. Um, 
this is the Nautilus. And David, uh, I'm sorry, I keep going bouncing back to David Packard. Uh, Bob Ballard uh, brought me on board his boat. Uh, I was a little nervous because he has a reputation. And he says, so, Buzz, have you seen the movie? And I said, the movie? No, I don't know what movie you're talking about. So I was thinking he was talking about the documentaries that he does. Well, um, he said to his daughter, who was on the cruise with us, he says, go get the movie, honey. And, and Buzz, come on into the lounge. I want you to watch the movie. So I walked into the lounge. He's got a bottle of wine. And he plugs in 20,000 leagues under the sea. <laughs> and, uh, and his ship's named after the Nautilus. He, uh, he's really dressed it up on the inside to look very much like the Nautilus in the movie. And uh, here I was, terrified of this guy. And come to find out, he's a kid at heart, just like I am. And, uh, and he was teaching his daughter well. Uh, we had a wonderful time. I got to dive with him. He has a, uh, an ROV that ha is a two-part system. So the Argus that you see there, the silver, is the secondary system. And Hercules is the yellow. And they kind of fly like this. The Argus is dropped down on a wire, and it just dangles there, just hangs there. And it has propellers uh, or thrusters that can spin it round and round, and the camera that can move up and down like this. And then you have 30, feet of, 30 meters of flying tether that you can use to uh, fly the vehicle wherever you want to go. Then the ship follows the, Ar uh, follows the Hercules around and gets us as close to that system as possible so that we can do our work without stretching our tether too tight. And one of the great things about this is if you're flying a system like this and it's all alone, you can't see that system. But if you have the secondary system that's looking down on that thing, sometimes you see things that you would have missed. And I flew for 20 years and my biggest dream was to see this kind of animal with the ROV. Each one is five minutes long. Fantastic. So if you're if you're watching yeah. on channel one, yeah. it's a super sampler. It yes. is the heck is that? Oh my god. Oh my goodness, what is We're at fifteen hundred feet. Okay, so we have a humpback Oh, well, we need to so uh, you can track it when you get back here. Alright, let's let's uh, move the camera. Zoom over. out, look around. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna turn the M three off guys. So these are all the scientists in the in the control room and the pilots. Okay. Zoom out on our Wow. These are all trained professionals. Oh wow. I hope it was recorded. Yes, it's recorded. Yeah. He's coming back. He's coming back. There he is. There he is. Oh wow, look, you can zoom in. There he is. Herc's camera. Can we move the Herc camera a little bit? I can as far as I can. Oh you wow. <laughs> All praying professionals. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> He's just doing laps. So this is a juvenile sperm whale. It's the first sperm whale that came back to the uh, Gulf right. of Mexico after the BP oil spill. But the first one that was seen back here. Is going to be deep enough? This animal swam around us for about 12 minutes. And uh, <clears throat> so when I was 10 years old and I watched that whale swim out of sight, wondering what the heck it sees during its day, this whale was looking at us going, geez, I wonder what the heck that is, and I wonder what they see in a day. <laughs> so... My, uh, I'd kind of gone full circle here, and it was, it was definitely time to come home. See the, the rakes on the side of it from the giant squid? Architubus and Colossitubus. Here, get yourself some screen captures. That's Max, our pilot. He's checking out the bottom. He's gonna sniff the bottom. Here he comes. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I will signal him with our backboard. <laughs> so we were hanging out. We were looking for methane seeps. We hang out in the in the midwater and we spin around slowly. And the methane that's coming out of the bottom of the ocean comes up. And as it comes up, it expands. And so we can see it with our sonar. 
and we can follow it right down to the source. And uh, and uh, so we were we were just basically hovering and holding station when he showed up and uh, checked us out. And as quick as he came in and checked us out, he was off and gone again. How long can they stay down there before they have to come back up from there? Uh, well, at least 12 minutes, uh, <laughs> but I, I think it's more like an hour. Uh, I, I don't know exactly how long it is, but I know that they, uh, walrus, I think, are an hour plus, and I think these guys are about an hour, yeah. We've, we've watched them go down and then resurface again, and a lot of times they'll go down into a, a deep hole to look for the squid, and they'll come right back up again where they went down, and so it... it you can usually count on them being down for about an hour. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, <clears throat> as you can tell, I've had a bunch of mentors, a bunch of people that I really respect, and a bunch of people that have made life for me uh, awesome. I have, uh, I never knew what I wanted to be when I was a kid. Um, I'm still wondering, but uh, I think that I'm getting to the point where I figured it out. And I gotta say, it's it's wonderful to have these people as mentors, and um, and this is just a handful of them. But uh, I decided that it was my turn to turn around and give back. So I went back to Maine, and uh, one of the herring boats that I used to fill with fish, uh, an old fellow that owned it said, you're going to do good things with the kids, and I want you to have this. So he donated this vessel to us. The hull's been all rebuilt and we're about to uh, finish off the project and get her back on the water so she can hold 17 people and we can go out and cruise around and do the fun things that I used to do as a kid and teach the new, the, 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 this generation, I guess, what it was like back in the old days because nowadays they have gained so much technology that they go out, they haul a thousand traps at breakneck speed catch as many lobsters as they can. They come in, they buy giant trucks, and they drive them to Florida in the winter. There's really no s substance to their lives as far as I'm concerned. We used to have to work in the fish houses. We used to have to work with the old fishermen, learn, this, learn the ways of the, the old ways. And nowadays it's more of a, it's just a, a, a process that they go through. And it, the it seems to have lost the, the romantic luster that it used to have as, as a commercial fisherman. So we're, we're trying to train them a little bit more about how life used to be on the, co on the, Gulf, on the coast of Maine. We have uh, another 80-foot vessel that we uh, can take 22 passengers on, 22 students, 22 uh, adults. If you know of any adults that would like to go out for a week on our boat, uh, we'd love to take you out there and teach you the really old ways. And um, eventually we want to put this on board the Pauline, the, the first vessel that you saw, so that we can go out and explore the Gulf of Maine and come all the way down here to the Hudson Canyon and go offshore and do some really deep work. Um, we teach our kids how to scuba dive. Uh, and uh, they work with us when they do the work with us, they get uh, one certification after 100 hours. And so what we're trying to do is over the four years of high school, they get their basic open water, their advanced, their specialty diver certification, and then their, their uh, dive master certification. Uh, here's a young lady that uh, I worked with since she was a freshman, and she's now down in the Turks and Caicos doing scientific diving. Um, and another thing, uh, put this one out of order, I'm sorry. But another thing that we do is introduce them to the mentors that meant so much to me and, uh, and hopefully get them engaged in, in the science that they're trying to do. So over here we've got the Alvin over at Woods Hole and this gentleman standing in the middle is uh, Will Sellers. He's the, the pilot that flew Bob Ballard down to the Titanic when they first went down in the Alvin. Uh, of course, Sylvia Earle here and here and here. Um, and this young lady was so excited about meeting Sylvia Earl that she couldn't get close to her. She was afraid she would just fall apart. So <laughs> I was a buffer in between them. And uh, uh, this young lady was from Puerto Rico, and she sailed with both of us. We, both Will and I were piloting the ROV for Bob Ballard. 
And at 16 years old, she got to sit in the pilot seat and fly the ROV uh, down around uh, Cuba, uh, actually. So, um, and, and she stays in touch. She, this was five years ago. She still stays in touch and asks me questions, asks me to write her letters of reference and, and uh, recommendation, and uh, as do all the other uh, kids that we work with. And I was speaking with Michelle today. Um, you can see here that um, there are very few guys in our in our uh, program. Most of the people that s start with us and stick with us are women, young ladies, and uh, they uh, they've been um, doing some great things. They not only work with us throughout the whole program and get to the end of the program and and uh, become very successful with us, but they move on. We have others that that dive in the. Uh, uh, One's uh, an instructor in Greece, uh, works for uh, the Catalina Island Marine Institute, and this summer is going to be working on Sail Caribbean, so we're pretty proud of her. Uh, another one is going to be sailing with Bob Ballard this year and is at the University of Rhode Island. So uh, i got to say I'm pretty proud of my kids. <laughs> yeah, These two, um, they graduated from college, and I put them to work on the boat down in Antarctica. Uh, Matt's still down there. David has come back ashore, and he's going back to school. But uh, Matt is now the lead MT marine technician down on the boat. And we've put uh, 12 people on the boat so far. And uh, here's, here's my, uh, uh, one of my friends that is down in the Turks and Caicos doing her research diving. And uh, she might just be playing here, but uh, she enjoys, she's, she's better in the water than she is on land. Um, a lot of what we do uh, when we're teaching the kids to, to dive, they're, many of them are fishermen. So we take them out, teach them to dive, and then we take them on about five dives before we let them go on their own. We take them on these dives because we want to show them the environment that they're collecting their resources from and where they're littering their, uh, the, the waters that they collect their resources from. We don't tell them a thing. We just put them in the water, take them down there, and when they come back to the surface, every time they say, what the heck's going on down there? Why aren't we doing something about this? And I'm like, you're the fisherman. Why are we not doing something about this? So in the last 12 months, we have started a new program that uh, gets us the ability to do some research, do some policy change, these guys are protesting. They're going home to their parents and they're saying, Dad, you're littering the bottom of the ocean with your traps. We've got to do something about it. And in turn, he's educating his father about what he, see, he or she sees. And we're taking Greta's um, advice and we're trying to move to action and do something that makes the world a better place. We are getting, so right here, this is what the uh, lobster trap's made of. It's uh, about a th 3 16 inch wire coated in PVC. PVC is negatively buoyant, so it sinks to the bottom of the ocean and it gets in, in tra trapped in the sediment. And over here, you've probably seen a lot of this research being done. These, uh, this is a shrimp larva that uh, is eating the plastic and they, uh, they uh, are able to make it glow. And uh, they're finding that their guts are full of it. So they think they're full and they starve to death. Uh, the fishermen are wondering, why the heck can't we catch shrimp anymore? Why can't we catch all the fish that we used to catch? A big part of the problem could be that these animals at a young age are ingesting this plastic and they're dying off before they get a chance to actually make something of themselves. So we're collecting uh, cores around the, uh, the traps that we're finding on the bottom of the ocean. And... Uh, as somebody said to me the other day, they told me that they weren't a scientist. I'm not a scientist either. We need help. And maybe some of you in the audience can help us. We're trying to break down these cores and figure out just what's going on with the sediment that we're, we're collecting. And uh, so if any of you want to talk about that a little later, uh, maybe getting, helping us by getting involved, uh, I'd love to talk to you. Uh, and we need some help. Uh, so 
I'm really excited about this project. Like I say, it started 12 months ago. An old fisherman that owned a boat like the Pauline, who's now a, a town father, gave us two acres. And he said, you do whatever you want to do with this, build up your traps to treasure program. And so I said, okay, well, we've got to figure this out. So we started talking with different people. And just in the last two weeks, I've spoken with the, the first four here um, up in Maine, showed them our, our facility. And then I went up to Canada, to Halifax, and I talked to the next three groups, which are, are folks that are doing uh, science and, and recovering marine debris in the ocean up in, in the Canadian waters. I came home, and the day after I came home from Halifax, I get a call from the Maine Lobstermen's Union. And the Maine Lobstermen's Union said, we have money that we have to spend on the environment, education, and community. And I said, oh, pick me. <laughs> and they did. They picked us, and we're going to duplicate our process up and down the coast of Maine and try and get as many traps off the, off the shore, off the wharves, out of the dooryards of these fishermen, and out of the ocean. So we're going to be... We, this is our two acres. Uh, we collected, in two days, we collected 300 traps. The kids got excited. They went out, two of them, two kids in two days, went out and talked to all the fishermen that they knew, and they said, how many do you want? We've got 10,000. And I said, oh, just slow down. Give me 300, and then we'll build the process. So we uh, made a makeshift crusher here, and we're crushing them down. Here's 50 traps that fit in the space that 12 traps usually set, uh, fit in. We're trying to develop a, uh, a water jet that will take the PVC off the traps so that we can recycle the, the steel and, uh, and get the plastic completely out of the system. Um, we've been talking in the last two weeks. These new uh, ideas have come to the front. So we have 4,500 islands and ledges around the Gulf of Maine. We have a lot of shoreline that's difficult to get to. So we want to build a barge that we can jack up, let the tide go out from under us, and collect all of this garbage that's on the shoreline up in Maine. This is what I'm talking about. So this is after a storm in, in February last year. And uh, so we've got all these traps. I mean, they, there's, there's 10 or 15 traps, and then there are even more down here on the, on the beach. Our kids are doing uh, cleanups in the, in the harbors and around the shore, and they're coming up with amazing amounts of trash. And uh, so we're looking forward to taking that trash out of the water, getting them on their way to a, a, a career that they really enjoy, and uh, turning the, the coast of Maine back into a place that looks like this. Um, I'd like to do it down here in New York as well. Anybody have any, uh, have any feelings about that? Do you think that that's something that's necessary? Something that needs to be done down here? Yeah? Love to talk to you as well. So uh, thank you for your time. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. What depth of water do the traps get swept up from? Uh, it, it, they come from all kinds of depths. Uh, some of these fishermen are fishing 70 fathom deep, 70, 80 fathom. Um, those will tumble. They'll, they'll tumble. But the, the ones that are, as you get closer to the shore, of course, you get more, uh, more wave action and, and uh, they, they uh, five fathom of water to 35 fathom of water will tumble up on the shore um, fairly regularly. And I, I walk on, and it, it's funny because the, the way things work, the traps tend to come up in, in one cove or another and not uh, on the other side of the, uh, on one side of the cove, but not on the other side of the cove. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's hit or miss, but when they come up on a certain, in a certain area, they really make a heck of a mess. Yes. So why aren't more young men interested in uh, being involved I mean, when they're in high school? Money. 
they would they they need to go out and fish. The the status quo hasn't been changed yet, but we're working on that. So the the young men, I mean, some of these kids in high school are making one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. It's hard to convince them that they have to change their way of life because they're told by their fathers and grandfathers, oh, science is coming in and they don't want us to do this. So we're trying to change that status quo by teaching them what's going on, having them see it firsthand and, and making up their own mind to change that. And when they do, like I say, they go home, they talk to their fathers, their grandfathers, their aunts, their uncles, all these people that are fishing and it's starting to make a difference. And that's why I think these, uh, these guys from the uh, Lobster Union have asked us to consider uh, working with them. But uh, the, the, typically the young men are fishing. The young ladies are thinking about college. Yeah. And um, so it's, it's, it's kind of easy to talk to them and say, hey, is there a problem here? Yep, and they want to do something about it. The young men, they're more thinking about the big trucks and the big boats and going fast. Um, but they're they're changing their mind. They're changing their way of thinking, and, and we're starting to get more and more uh, young men involved. Yeah. Yeah. Yes? Is the lobster industry so good that there's, or the fishing industry so good that there's an infinite amount of jobs? Because around here, what the, the, the trend has been that all the bay men right. and so on have all have really crashed. Mm -hmm. When I first got here, the Right. Right, right. But in Maine, it's still. In Maine, we have 7,500 fishermen, and each one of those fishermen has takes one, two, or three people with him. So you know, you've got a, that's a, a pretty big industry, and um, and even though it's still uh, a lucrative way to make a living, there the the the, the, the Gulf of Maine is warming. 99 times faster, or 99 percent faster than warming faster than 99 percent of the rest of the ocean. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, I need another cup of coffee. <laughs> but uh, it is warming. It is it is uh, having an effect on the lobsters, but it's still only halfway up the Gulf of Maine, uh, working its way towards the Bay of Fundy. And uh, so, from my little island, my little island is basically the cutoff, and um, the, the, but the fishermen further north are making a killing because those lobsters are moving with the with the temperature. The lobsters not. I mean, when I used to go up to uh, Casco Bay as a child, there was a lot of herring nets and things like that. A lot of. They, I don't know if those are still out there or not. No, they're shutting them all down. And and one of the things that I tell the fishermen in Maine, because uh, I've been down here for about three years now, three or four years, and. Uh, Working with some educators on the on the island, and um, to see all the bunker and all the alewives and all the herring that you guys are, uh, you know, that are coming back here, uh, it's amazing to see, because our whales that we had, you know, whales all summer long, blue says fins, humpbacks, and 60% of them are gone now. They're all down here. And so what you're doing down here, whatever it is, keep doing it because it's great. <laughs> um, and we need to learn from you up there because they, I mean, they, they basically, they, they see a resource uh, and they use it until it's gone. And they feel that if we use it until it, it collapses, it'll just come back again. And they're learning that the cod fisheries, the scallop fisheries, the herring, the, the shrimp, they're not coming back. And, and so they're really scared. So to have a scientist come to them and say, we've got the answer for you. You've got to have ropeless gear, or you've got to reduce your catch, or you've got to reduce your number of traps. They're like, you can't tell us that. You can't put us out of business. And, and they say, you know, like you did all those other fisheries. But in fact, the other fisheries were put out of business because they over, overfished them. And, uh, and there's other, other factors that come into play. but. Um, yeah, the, the, the herring that you saw, they're, they're no more. Yeah. 
postdoc that I worked with at Ambari, who's down at the University of South Carolina, but they're not able to do it anymore. Um, so we are looking for someone to help us with that, that process. Anybody? Contact Larry Mayer in the Darling Center. Yes. He's the, he's the great expert in Maine on sediment. Yes. Yeah, I know Larry. There are people here too, but, but, but he would be the person who could lead you to, uh, Thank you. to a way of doing it. Yeah. But it depends a little bit too on what you want to measure. I mean, if you want plastics versus chemistry. Right, right. So, I mean, you guys are the scientists. I would, I would look to you to ask that question. But uh, uh, my, my question is, you know, when I learned about firefighting on the boats, if you put a stick of PVC 12 inches long in a 12 by 12 room, it'll kill two people in, in a very short time. It's that toxic. And so my question is, is the PVC that's leaching off these traps as toxic? Is it, uh, what effect is it having? Is, is it just that they're ingesting the plastic? Uh, or is it that there's some kind of off-gassing or whatever uh, that's, that's doing even more damage that we can't see? So uh, those are questions that I would have for you rather than uh, you for me. Um, if anybody knows of anybody that uh, I'll talk to Larry um, definitely and uh, um, see if we can we find people some. Your work on microplastics. Really? The to talk to you. There you go. Okay. <laughs> Who is that? All right. Yeah. Love to talk to you. <laughs> yeah. right. Well, thank you very much. If anyone, there's lunch afterwards and you can continue the discussions. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks for having me.